Okay, um, welcome everybody to the Jewish Study Center. I'm Jerry Garfinkel. I'm the treasurer of the Jewish Study Center. And as such, I uh, need to tell you that our classes are very popular. Our instructors are very knowledgeable. Um, and um, I'm also letting people in as, as I go. Um, but we, and our classes are free, but we do have some expenses. And so we encourage people to uh, donate. If you want to donate to us, go to our website, www.jewishstudycenter.org and click on uh, donate. And you can donate from your PayPal account or the credit card or with a check. If you indicate you want to uh, donate with a check, uh, the website will tell you where to send your check. Okay. Uh, for uh, tonight's presentation, as you probably realize, it is being recorded. Um, also, I have the closed caption on. So if you can't understand my New York accent, basically many years ago at least, um, or Jeremy or, or Mindy, uh, you can watch the, uh, the words fly by. Okay, so uh, for today's uh, presentation, I'm going to first introduce uh, Mindy Reiser, who is our vice president, and she'll introduce the actual uh, um, presentation. Oh, one more thing. Um, everybody is muted. And so if you, we do encourage you to have questions and comments, but please put your comments and questions in the chat box and address them to everybody. Sometimes you make a comment, someone else will comment on your comment, et cetera, et cetera. So address it to everybody. Thank you. Okay, now Mindy, I'll uh, bring you on and you can, it's your Okay, time. welcome everyone. And thanks uh, if you're in uh, the Washington area, it's a lovely evening and I hope it's a lovely evening wherever you are in the world because uh, happily through Zoom, people are from across the world. So let me introduce our speaker, who is a very busy fellow, and we're delighted he was able to take the time to be with us tonight. I'm talking about Jeremy J. Fingerman, who became the CEO of the Foundation for Jewish Camp in 2010, following a highly successful 20-plus year career in the consumer foods industry. And his experience in this world has been uh, very valuable for the myriad responsibilities that camps entail and that he has experience and understanding from many, many perspectives. Jeremy received his uh, AB from Columbia University and his MBA from Harvard Business School. He lives in Fort Lee, New Jersey with his wife and his two young adult children. And before we turn to Jeremy, I want to encourage you, if you've had experience with Jewish camp, either as campers, as counselors, as administrative staff, as parents of campers, let us know. Tell us what camp and uh, where it was. And now let's go to Jeremy. Thank you, Mindy, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be with all of you and to have this chance to share uh, a bit of our story. Um, I, I am, uh, as Mindy said, it put in the chat, if you will, just uh, uh, what your camp connections are. Uh, it's always good to, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, um, to, to just get a broader sense of uh, who, who we're with. and. Uh, um, if you attended camp or you sent your kids to camp, um, it, it, it's nice to uh, nice to know. Okay, I'm gonna. Uh, I have a, a presentation and a couple of videos to share, just to give you a taste of uh, of the world of Jewish camp and the work of our foundation. Um, I encourage you to, uh, uh, if you have questions, any clarifications or questions, we'll we've got time. Uh, I think set aside at the end for uh, for Q and A discussion, and uh, we look forward uh, to uh, hearing your your thoughts. So, 
I'm going to start with, oh, I was going to, you know, I'm not looking at the chat, so uh, I know Mindy will, will take care. Okay, Onabar, oh, I got a great story about Onabar. <laughs> um, it, it, maybe we'll, we'll get to that, but, uh, and Janet will tell, can tell us about Onabar too, since it uh, became part of uh, the New Jersey Y uh, uh, set of camps. Has Kramer, great. Sedgwin, well met, great. Uh, yeah, a lot of Sedgwick. Okay, and and of course, yes. Now we know Rama. Uh, in in and I, I bet here we have capital camps. Uh, quite a few. Anyway, uh, we'll uh we'll be able to uh, see all that. Okay, so uh, I want to um tell you about the field of Jewish camp, which began 120 years ago. In 1902, the first Jewish camps opened, Surprise Lake Camp in Cold Spring, New York, and Tamarack Camp, Camp Tamarack in, uh, in Michigan. These were designed to be fresh air uh, camps, uh, designed to give city kids a chance to be out in the fresh air and to have a, a sense of uh, belonging. Uh, and I, I, I think all of us touch, I, I, I think back my, my dad in growing up in Cincinnati, Ohio in the 1920s, was in the city and got a scholarship to attend the, in Cincinnati's Camp Livingston. And so he was a camper at a young age and he and my mom, the same way, made sure that we were, we were campers as well. Um, and I love seeing, I see Penny, I'm glad you're here, Penny, nice to see you and, and Herzl Camp in Wisconsin. We, we got a lot of different uh, camps represented. That's great. Okay, uh, and that kind of I got a slide uh, about that. So I don't really have time to tell the whole story of the 120 years, but um, I, I, I wanted you to see that uh, this link, the Jewish Funders Network six years, six, seven years ago, uh, produced and published a uh, a, a, a series of publications. And six years ago, volume four, they published a green book for to help investors guide their investment in the in different fields. And in our case, it was a Jewish camp. I think uh, uh, the volume before was uh, uh, day schools. So it was, uh, you know, different uh, topics. Um, and this publication, you can go to our website to, uh, to uh, download it and get a glimpse. It gives you a, just a wonderful overview of the field and some of the innovations and, and some of the stories. So um, I encourage you to do that. I think uh, Mindy will uh, put that in the chat or we'll certainly uh, send it out afterwards. So I'm going to start this story back uh, 24 years ago in 1998. We, a visionary entrepreneurial couple, philanthropists and uh, business people uh, were participating in the Wexner Heritage Program. And they responded to the challenge, to a challenge from Les Wexner to what are you gonna do, he said, to help uh, advance the Jewish world. And the builders understood the power of camp, Jewish camp, and coming out of that, experience, they committed to establishing a public foundation with a goal of unifying and galvanizing the field of Jewish camp. There were lots of camps at the time, but they kind of operated on their own independently, maybe within movements, but certainly not fully together and uh, to galvanize the field and to drive support, uh, philanthropic support across uh, North America. And, and the one guidepost was to significantly increase the number of participants in camps. That's the number of uh, youth, of teens, college age counselors, all of that uh, critical. And, and uh, they really set on a, a, a mission to do so. Uh, a few years later, our signature program was created. I want to call attention to one happy camper. Um, some of you may be familiar with it. It's a program that works to inspire new campers uh, and new families that, that let their campers try Jewish camp, Jewish overnight camp through an incentive grant, first time incentive grant. The program was developed to engage Jews who find themselves on the margins or even outside the Jewish, Jewish life. 
And we partner now with 50, over 50 Jewish federations who remain steadfast in their commitment to ensure that all children can discover a deep connection to the Jewish community, values, culture, and tradition. And they know, as do we, that Jewish camp is probably the best vehicle for doing so. Once in a partnership, we know that uh, these federations that look in partnership with FJC, with our foundation, uh, we can effectively become advocates, conveners, catalyzers, and accelerators for the field and for all of our different federation partners. Today, we have 320 Jewish day and overnight camps that are a part of our network. And in, and in 2022, this past summer, collectively 175,000 youth, teens, and young adults uh, participated in uh, summer camps across the range of these, uh, of these different camp movements. We are not an association. No camp pays dues to the foundation. Um, we work with only nonprofit camps versus the many four popular and secular uh, day and overnight camps that you might be familiar with. There's five criteria to be included in our network. And once you're in your network, you could qualify for, uh, apply for and qualify for grants. The five criteria, one, you have to be a 501c3 nonprofit. Two, you have to articulate, have an articulated Jewish mission. Three, you have to celebrate Shabbat. We don't say Shomer Shabbat, but we want all the camps to create a Shabbat experience that is different from the rest of the week. Day camps do that very well, Friday afternoons with a song session and, and maybe even uh, having uh, par-baked kalas come home with the uh, campers um, on, on Friday to give a little bit of a Shabbat aroma at, at the home. And certainly for the overnight camps, um, it's typical that people would all dress in white and white tablecloths on the table. Um, and it's a special day of the week. And it doesn't matter which type of camp you go to. Everybody says Shabbat and Havdalah were the highlights of their experience. The fourth, Israel has to be a part of your educational mission. And the vast majority of these 300 camps have Israeli shlichim, emissaries from Israel that work in camp during the summer. That program has grown and it's created a kesher, a connection and a relationship uh, between Israel and uh, our camp, campers and counselors in North America. The final piece, we hope that all these camps have an aspirational arc and that when you start your first year, you wanna come back year after year, you aspire to be the oldest age group, the oldest Ada in camp. You aspire to go on the Israel trip of your camp. Uh, Route One, now a big investment uh, that uh, camps in the field are making to reinvigorate teen travel. And then really the aspiration that you come back as a counselor. And uh, I think it was uh, 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 Penny who said, uh, it was camper, a camper parent, a camp grandparent, board member. Uh, I think she also worked uh, you know, camp too. So anyway, that, that's, the, uh, that's what our hope is. And, and, and the way it works. It's all about community. A community investment in Jewish camp is not supporting camps for camp's sake. We're not in the business of camp. We're in the business of creating a more vibrant future, more vibrant Jewish future. And camp works, we know it works, in building the next generation of committed, engaged Jewish members and leaders and supporters. As a community, I think, we all recognize that we have very uh, few investments that yield the kind of dividends that Jewish camp has proven time and time again to be one of those key investments. We know more campers today will lead to stronger uh, communities tomorrow. Our research, uh, our foundation has worked a lot on uh, different research studies, and we put together a compilation of all the community studies that were done, uh, completed in the uh, 1990s. And 
study after study confirms that if you invest in Jewish youth, you're going to automatically get all kinds of engagement as adults. Donors and philanthropists have come to believe this model. With Jewish camp, you see results 20, 30, 40 years from now. And the results could be these measurements that, that are uh, adults who were campers as youth are more likely to donate to federations like Shabbat Candles, feel attached to Israel. And even the more recent Pew studies have said uh, adults, those who attended summer camp as kids, as adults, they're two and a half times more likely to, to say, to identify as a Jew as an adult. Our camp, camp develops leadership. Um, whether they become Jewish camp, Jewish professionals, educators, rabbis, teachers, uh, the Jewish educators, and actually in, in, of young people today, seven out of 10 had attended Jewish camp of those in their 20s and 30s. So it is a factory for producing Jewish leaders. Our goal very simply is to enable more kids to experience the magic of Jewish camp. And we do it, we've worked now over these 24 years really in three areas. If you have strong leadership, if you build and, and invigorate and, and, and train and develop strong leaders who are creating wonderful, fresh, contemporary Jewish experiences on facilities that are, uh, have a, a range of, of high quality facilities and, and for experiences, that combination works to drive, uh, to drive participation and, um, and to drive growth. So we've had initiatives over the years in each of these three areas, and I'll uh, comment a, a, a more on them. I wanted to give you just quickly a, um, a, a number of, of our achievements in the last 24 years. Our foundation from the original two and add $2 million that the builders uh, started the foundation with. We've raised $275 million for the field, raised it and granted out to the field $275 million. One happy camper, I mentioned our signature program. We've granted over $100 million worth of incentive grants to over 100,000 first time campers across North America in those 50 partnerships. We also, uh, if you're a family that gets PJ Library, you can qualify for a incentive grant through PJ Library if it doesn't, uh, if, if your federation um, is, is sold out or you, the federation isn't participating. And many camps also, 60 camps participate in one happy camper as well. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant to uh, click this. So that's the 100 million statistic with the 100,000 uh, first time campers. We have a building loan program, interest-free building loans. We have loaned out $40 million that had interest-free, that paid back over a five-year period, um, that has helped $140 million worth of capital projects to be completed. If you're building a new bunk, a uh, new series of bunks or a new dining hall, you're raising money that might be payable in pledges over five years, it's in our interest to get those bunks or that dining hall uh, built um, quickly. So we'll give a loan to let the camp build that based on the fact that they've got pledges that'll come in over the next number of years. We've never had a default and uh, it's a, just a terrific, terrific program. We've had an 80% increase in the number of campers on an annual basis from 1988 to uh, 2022, and I like I love this statistic. This is a big business if, if, in a big operation and impactful. Six hundred thousand unique individuals have attended camp in these 24 years. That's if I go to camp once, or I go to camp for five, six, seven years, I only count once. So it, it doesn't matter. But the unique number of campers, based on the retention rate, etc., six hundred thousand. Uh, it's big, big uh, volume. We were uh, honored uh, to receive this strong endorsement from Professor Jack Wertheimer of the Jewish Theological Seminary, who in his 
uh, a recent uh, publication, Giving Jewishly, How Big Funders Have Transformed American Jewish Philanthropy. He cites the Foundation for Jewish Camp as one of the great success stories of American Jewish philanthropy, of being a catalyst for significant uh, philanthropic support. Um, and it's really it, not just our support, not just the 275, but federations, local camp, the camps themselves have raised significant funds for scholarships, for capital improvements um, across the board. So as I think, as we continue building from this day, all of you on, on this call, on this Zoom, I, 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 I know that you can count on camps. You do count on camps. They're more essential than ever before, especially for developing the essential people skills, the social emotional learning, the skills that you truly need to, uh, you know, for life, for career, for college, all those readiness skills and people skills you develop uniquely and, 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 and really uh, effectively in an immersive environment, uh, away from parents, away from family, um, where you learn on your own. And so you can count on camps and camps can count on FJC for the resources needed to adapt to the rapidly changing environment that we're in. I don't need to tell you that uh, the, the rapid change uh, that we've experienced just in, in it, it's, it's hard to keep up with all the changes even on a daily basis uh, these days with the news cycle. Um, in uh, 2019, uh, we began a five-year strategic plan um, across all geographies uh, for the whole field. We said, the world is changing so rapidly pre-COVID. We have to accelerate the level of innovation and the ability to adapt and to be flexible um, uh, that each camp needs to be able to address what's coming our way. Um, Little did we know we were gonna be challenged in, in as many ways as, as we have, but we focused really down the center in, in the three areas I, similar to what I had shown before. Leadership development, adaptive talent, immersive learning, immersive Jewish experiences, and field growth. Within adaptive talent, we said it's about the counselor experience, but it's also about strengthening the professional pipeline. For immersive learning, camp, we know that camp cannot be just about the summer, but it has to be year-round experiences. Um, and you bring the Jewish sense of community and belonging. And, and we certainly learned that uh, for sure during COVID. But um, how do we amplify the Jewish and Israel education in camps? And how do we continue that year round? And then under field growth, how do we attract more families with young kids before they're ready for overnight camp? It could be family camp, it's day camp, it's those kind of retreat experiences that ultimately could lead to increased enrollment and participation. And as a foundation, we've invested on the two sides uh, an innovation lab, in, in regional centers, and uh, in our own increasing knowledge and data, um, and then our commitment to executing with excellence, um, increasing the talent internally and a better use of technology. Um, and I just wanna say the challenges, if you just think of the complexity of the world we're in, even coming out of COVID, the threats of wild uh, wildfires out West, uh, the mental health crisis that we're all experiencing amplified even more in in both staff and and the uh, and the campers themselves, and uh, it, it it it's across geographies. The issues may differ in some geographies versus others, but um, we have an important role in healing, uh, you know, in in healing our camp uh, community. Now, I'd like you to take a uh, oh, uh, uh, this put together in the voices of camp professionals in the field, the story of uh, COVID and coming out of COVID. Here we go. The time has come to begin planning for a different reality reality that for the first time in our 70 year history, 
there will not be camp as we have always known it this summer. When we looked at the risks, both known and unknown, they're just too great. And we want to lead with our values, first and foremost, of which are the health and safety of our entire camp community. So while this isn't my plan A, I, I am asking you all to flex and to bend and to adapt. We hope you'll all remember that the comeback is always stronger than the setback. Camp isn't going anywhere, and neither are we. We met the moment by responding and just saying, of course, we gotta get these kids to camp. How are we gonna do it? It was important for us to fulfill the mission of making sure that all Jewish children have a Jewish summer experience. Being in a camp environment, a Jewish camp environment, full of love and hugs, just saw the transition from that feeling of anxiety and sadness to smiles and laughter. We have power and opportunities that present themselves to lead, to help, and to make a difference. And it's really amazing. We realized that the work that we do touches lives well beyond only our campers. Our families, our partners, our stakeholders are all in this together. And when we realized it made us all that much more dedicated to our mission. Camp remained and maybe became even more for some people a safe, happy, wonderful place where kids were able to get some sunshine. The last few years with COVID, the challenges going on in the world, with all the things that we've been dealing with, I feel very proud that we were able to help our Jewish community have a Jewish camp experience. Thank you for stepping up to address the needs, not only of the camp community, but also the global community. For welcoming campers from communities in crisis. Thank you for building more inclusive communities where everyone belongs. For ensuring that every kid who wanted camp, who needed camp, had the chance to attend. Thank you for making camps a place of wellness, giving everyone an opportunity to thrive, for building communities based on Jewish values, and for creating unforgettable, joyous Jewish experiences. Thank you for creating the magic of camp when magic felt out of reach. I get a bit of a chill when I think about three years ago. It's this time, three years ago, when uh, camps had to really uh, look at what was not going to be possible. And we quickly sort of calculated that by not opening across the, the field in overnight camps, the cost was exceeded $150 million. Those were the fixed costs of running camp at, uh, even if you don't open, you still have the costs on staff, um, on uh, the uh, maintenance of uh, the site, um, office space, uh, all kinds of experience. And camps are spending money during the year leading up to camp in, in preparation. So we came up with a strategy in three buckets. And camps and, and organizations across uh, you know, our organization and across the Jewish community. There were cost reductions, serious cost reductions with furlough staff, reducing hours and pay, staff layoffs, decreased uh, expenses, shifted, shifting away from capital projects. Short-term loans, we're so grateful to the uh, uh, Small Business Administration, the federal government that put out the PPP loans, a, uh, an amazing effort, amazing collaborative effort by the major national Jewish foundation funders and, and the Jewish communal relief, uh, re, uh, re response and impact fund gave out loans. We had, uh, I think, about $15 million worth of loans that we gave out on behalf of JCRIF to, to, uh, some, to uh, some of the camps. Um, many camps were able to get rolled over tuition. Parents kept some of the money or just rolled it over from 2020 to 2021. That was a short-term loan. And in camps also, $65 million of new money raised to cover this 
through federations stepping up and they did in a big way, donated tuition. The Grinspoon Foundation put out an Altogether Now, uh, an initial $10 million program, and then a second $10 million program. And camps on their own generated significant fundraising. We then created a roadmap for moving forward. And we said, even um, as we mitigated the first loss, we knew that 2021 and 2022 still needed help. We had to catalyze the funding community with continued urgency beyond just the immediate COVID problem. And uh, what I bucketed are three areas of pipelines that we had to restore and rebuild. Pipeline of, for marketing recruitment for campers. If you have no campers in 2020, you've got to rebuild in 2021 and beyond. We had to recruit, prepare, and retain seasonal staff. If you had been a staff member in 19, 18, 19, and 20 would have been maybe your third year, you didn't come back in 2021. So experienced staff members didn't necessarily, weren't really ready to come back. And uh, camps had a tough time filling uh, those, those spots. And then how do we support the camp professionals, the pipeline, some people that either furloughed or laid off, and also just the ongoing complexity in, and uh, uh, difficulty of that job, uh, it just calls attention. It's a valuable job for our community. We need it, and we're continuing to work to, re to rebuild that pipeline. We also had great, some great innovations that happened during, the, um, uh, during COVID. I think the virtual programming uh, that was very successful, whether it was town halls, virtual uh, innovations, Kabbalat Shabbat, Abdallah concerts, um, that really helps in, in uh, uh, bodes well in terms of um, year round engagement. Um, and I think there was a trust given to these camp brands that uh, the camp professionals really did a great job of, of uh, sort of uh, really being strong for their community. I think you heard that in the voices of, uh, of the directors there. And we've also realized that many of the issues that are tackling uh, came out of COVID also that it was regional in nature. You know, there may be some feder uh, federal laws, but really state laws and it really county by county was making health, uh, health decisions. Um, but uh, it, it, we, we realized that working together um, with partnership and collaborations across movements, across regions, day and overnight camps working together, synagogues, JCCs, other communal institutions, when we work together on a regional basis, I think we can be extremely successful. So where are we today? Uh, I, if you start and look back to 2016 to 2019, we were a field that was growing slow and steady, about 2% a year. But we had a decade of just really good, steady growth. One of the few fields that, uh, that had um, still a positive trend line. COVID hits, and you can see nothing in 2020 and 2021. Enrollment down 15%. Most, in many cases, it was because there were um, mitigations, uh, limitations put on by the health, uh, the, either uh, the, uh, CDC or the state or local uh, health authorities. And we had to prepare. We didn't know what kind of uh, outbreaks might happen. Camps created bubbles. Once you came in, you were tested. You didn't leave in that first year. 155,000 participants. But here's the big news. We grew 13% growth in uh, 2022. And we're now 96% of 2019, which had been a record year for enrollment. So I'm pretty confident that we will get close to, if not achieve and exceed 2019 levels. That is a story of a field facing an existential threat that three years later, four years later, is back on its feet and a uh, uh, full recovery uh, coming. It's a, it's a really magnificent story. Our data from the annual camp or census, uh, just like the last page, it would say overnight and day camp enrollment and retention are both up. 
staffing. Uh, I mentioned the counselor shortage and other seasonal staff. The camps were able to hire and bring in more international staff in 21 and 22. Um, certainly camps had to pay more money for staff. Um, and then I mentioned the mental health issue. We're very proud that um, uh, we've been able to award grants to 102 camps, day and overnight camps. That's about a third of our network for additional mesh, we call it mental, emotional, social, and spiritual health. We're adding new professionals and incremental professionals uh, that were as a result of uh, the visionary grant of uh, the Marcus Foundation. And uh, in addition, now they've been joined by support from federations, UGA Federation of New York, um, and the Federation in uh, uh, the, of, uh, of Los Angeles. Um, and modeled that, and that's helped us get to 102 camps. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, I guess I would say, this is a problem that we all face, um, but certainly time away, um, and it's happening at every level, campers, counselor, professionals, um, very, very much needed. Current challenges remain. And our foundation is, is focused on working with the field to address these challenges. First, staff retention has been lower, just coming out of, uh, uh, had been a trend and certainly coming out of COVID. It's made recruitment and training more difficult. So continuing to work at that staff experience, um, and we put out a series of grants, innovation grants to to pilot different ways to address the staff staffing issue and retention issue. The second challenge, camp tuition is increasing. Uh, camp tuitions are set sort of, let's say August, September of a year prior to opening. So for 2022, it was set in August, September of 21. 4% increase in 2022 on the revenue side, and you can imagine what it was happening on the cost side. I'll tell you that in a minute. But we know that uh, tuitions for this coming summer are up another six or eight percent, starting to get much more, getting more expensive. And so what we're seeing is more financial aid. It's been requested than ever before. And this is a trend that's going to continue. So individual camps raising money for their scholarship pools and us doing it on a North American basis with Federation partners and others. Overnight camp expenses increased at about three percentage points, 3% higher rate than revenues in 22. So camp tuition was up 4%, expenses were up at least 7%. So you can see how that differential can grow. We don't know what, uh, and, and if you price, let's say, uh, uh, let's say you get 8% gr um, growth in tuition, 7% growth in, so maybe you make some of it back, but you, you, you haven't recouped that which was lost in, uh, in 2022 yet. So it's going to take some time for camps to um, fully get back on their feet. And we've also seen a high level of turnover of professional staff. That is a trend affecting the entire Jewish community, whether it's schools, JCCs, federations, we're all suffering, but uh, certainly for this field, we want to find ways to address uh, that, that turnover, make the job, uh, the jobs are complex. How do we make it more, more and more manageable? Uh, I want to now show a, another video uh, that, again, from the words of camp professionals. I, I, I do so by saying that I'm very proud. Uh, to work with such amazing, amazing leaders. I'm proud of the confidence and optimism of, of our team and of the buoyancy of the field uh, as we work through this time of anxiety and uncertainty. Um, and I, 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 you'll hear some of the things that we're using uh, these, these summers to now reinvent and reimagine what camp, camp is and what camp leadership is and uh, you'll get a sense for it from this uh, video.
My name is Aaron. I'm Rabbi Jill Levy. Hey there, I'm Yaakov Fleischman. Hi, I'm Sherry Krell. And I am dedicated to providing the best experiences possible. I'm dedicated to keeping camp physically and emotionally safe. Now more than ever, we need to fortify that mission. We need to continue working hard. Not just at the JCC of Greater Pittsburgh's camp, but camps all over North America. And a place where cultures of kindness inclusion, and respectful discourse abound. As I think about the future of Jewish camp, I continue to be dedicated to create a safe, inclusive environment. Whether it be kids of color, LGBTQ plus kids, or kids from LGBTQ plus families. I fully believe and know how important the camp experience is for everyone, and will continue to do my best to provide those experiences to everyone. I believe that camp is a microcosm of how we want to live in the larger world. In a world that's filled with divisiveness, I am dedicated to building a community of Mahbok, sacred conversation where we feel the impact of our words and truly listen to each other. Our community is stronger, is richer, is more vibrant when we have kids who come with all different experiences and all different backgrounds. Now more than ever, we have all managed to current events, the aftermath of the pandemic, and political divisiveness. We all know that kids need camp, but they don't just need camp as a break from it all. They need camp because through it all, camp is the beacon of light into their futures. When I think about the future of Jewish summer camp, I remain dedicated to building Jewish leadership coming together with shared Jewish values and shared commitment to building Jewish camp and building the Jewish community. I am dedicated to creating a space where queer and trans Jewish campers can explore their Jewish identities without the fear of queer phobia, transphobia, or homophobia. And on the flip side, they can explore their queer and trans identities without the fear of anti-Semitism. I'm dedicated to ensuring that all Jewish families in Greater Boston know about the incredible impact that camp can have and making sure that they have access to the resources they need to make camp part of their family's Jewish journey. I'm dedicated to building a community that's deeply committed to belonging. Camp is a place where kids learn what the world could be and what the world should be. They learn that they can be agents of change and they return home understanding that each one of them has the power through Tukun Olam to change the world. just magnificent, magnificent people. This is why I, I love what I do. I work with so dedicated professionals. Um, and I love what, what Cindy put in the chat, but the positivity, the passion, the purpose, you heard it all, um, you know, in, in, in this group of uh, professionals, we just, uh, you know, so proud of them. And I often, I often say that Jewish camp is the laboratory and a launch pad for our entire Jewish community. You've heard a little bit, I think, this evening about the resilience and adaptability. Um, and with that, our field continues not to rest on its laurels, but to always look for new ways to attract and retain campers and staff and to expand their reach and their impact. Um, and we're excited about what the future holds. So. I'm uh, ready to open this up for any uh, uh, question. I'll turn it uh, back over to Mindy and uh, happy to take out any questions you have. Okay. Um, we've had some very enthusiastic responses in the chat and I wanna turn to that. We have a little time, but before we do that, just one or two questions and uh, to allow Jeremy maybe to catch his breath because he's been talking uh, nonstop for a while. In terms of the 13 years, yeah, that you've been in your position, how have you seen changes perhaps in the substantive dimension of Jewish education and Jewish learning? Is anything coming to mind as how things may have evolved in that direction? It's a great question. And uh, I'm happy to say that, uh, you know, again, thinking about camps as laboratories, we find that um, what happens at camp finds a way back into the, uh, to the communities at home over time. And um, so, it's, uh, I think uh, they mentioned a little bit about what the world can be and should be. 
the Jewish values that are communicated, substance of a substantive, he, some camps are doing more intensive Hebrew learning. Certainly, we've increased the number of Israelis and, and global uh, Jewish counselors that come to work in, in the camps to promote Jewish uh, global peoplehood, I think is a very important uh, piece. We've had initiatives um, under, uh, we had an initiative, we have an initiative called Hidur, how to um, beautify Jewish ritual and Jewish expression. And uh, so there's been some very good success uh, that camps have had there. And, uh, and what has been learned in those camps have been spread across movements and across geographies. Uh, I think Singing was always a big part of camp. And of course, Debbie Friedman of Blessed Memory, you know, came her, you know, she developed out of uh, the camping system. And um, I, I can tell you that there is more and more uh, intentional singing, higher quality mm. uh, singing and engagement uh, in, in that way. Um, better acoustics. Uh, camps have installed, you know, uh, Big computer screen, you know, big screens and computers, and now songs are always projected uh, up with the words uh, in Hebrew and in transliteration. But uh, and it's all done up, so your your voice is projecting uh, up. It's uh, quite done with such intentionality. Um, uh, so yeah, Torah uh, study more Hebrew. I see that there are camps, there are day camps that are doing full immersive Hebrew. Um, and, uh, it, you know, in different age groups and going up. And, um, and that's very exciting. You know, if, if you look, when you read the, the Green Book, the camp field had, had uh, started in the early uh, turn of the century. Um, in the 20s and 30s, in the 20s, a lot of educational programs, I think Sedgwin started maybe in the late 20s, uh, early 30s. Then there was an explosive growth around uh, 75 years ago, uh, either pre-state or post-state, many camps right now are cel or have celebrated or uh, starting to celebrate the 75 years um, or, or, or more. And, and, uh, um, and with that came a, a real deep connection with Israel. Uh, certainly Hebrew and Israel were, were you know, part of that, but Hebrew language, I think camps were really known for that gotten away from it over, uh, you know, uh, time. And I, I think in the last 13 years, we've made some headway, uh, certainly in the Hebrew as well. Okay. Jeremy, could you stop your, your screen sharing and we can see you better? Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, an interesting question from, I don't know who, but uh, the person asked, what about camp, Jewish camp for nerds, for those kids who don't uh, flourish in uh, soccer and uh, outdoor sports? That leads to the larger question, and this, of course, is the larger camping world, how the actual camp activities that are not even necessarily Jewish have shifted in the past 13 years. And well, they we have. And that the Jewish world. So uh, also a great question. I, I, uh, we started an initiative uh, right as I was coming on, uh, to create new specialty camps that were designed from the the very base, uh, the very beginning, to be a two week experience um, on rented properties with a a specific sort of skill and and uh, milieu. Each are attracting kids who wouldn't have gone to. Uh, the a traditional Jewish camp, or may have outgrown their camp, and for these yeah. teens, they would try things. So it was Eden Village was an organic, uh, sustainable farming camp. Hmm. Uh, it was created. Now there's two of them: one out in the east, one in the west. E Eden uh, Village, did you say? E Eden Village camp. Okay, all right. Fantastic. Uh, really, just uh, such a spirit, such a positive Jewish experience, but. You know, uh, sustainable farming. I will tell you, I love their, uh, they have a gar a farm and they designed the farm with seven plots and they teach about the Shemitah. And oh my on, God. Uh -huh. You know, so they have a garden uh, there with 12 plots and they grow a different 
thing in each of the 12 to represent the 12 months of the year. And the one example I always use is for the month of Av, which has Tisha B'Av, uh, the day of mourning, and, and Tu B'Av, the day of love, that plot grows rose bushes. The, the, the bud of love, the thorn of uh, you know, challenge. Uh, so, so creative. Uh, we have um, a, uh, a SciTech Academy, the URJ SciTech Academy for Science and Technology. Uh, very successful attracting kids of, uh, from all, all sorts of experiences. High-end coaches, high-end teachers that come. Um, and then uh, very successful sports camps. But again, high level of, uh, of, of support. You know, Maccabi Sports Camp in California, a uh, URJ Six Point Sports in, um, uh, in, in North Carolina. And then I'll give you uh, just a couple others. There's a, a camp called Camp Zeke. It's a, a wellness and a fitness kind of camp in, in the Northern Pocono Mountains. They've done a terrific job. And um, Sababa is a, a surfing camp, an ocean-based camp. Say again? Sababa, which uh-huh. Hebrew for, you know, but it's Sababa Beach Away, it's Beach Academy. And they run in Virginia, Virginia Beach, um, but it's a surfing and ocean experiences. They do just a, a, a fabulous job. Now, here's the kicker of the whole thing. That was a, those were big investments. We, we opened uh, 17 new camps in the past uh, 13 years, um, of which 13 were still operating. It's a pretty good track record. But in addition, we started a, uh, a, 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 an initiative called the Competitive Edge, where we're giving camps grants to upgrade their special, a specialty program within the traditional camp. We have Janet uh, Flegelman is here, just posted on Sababa, but the New Jersey Y camps really started that idea with a whole specialty programs, high quality within their traditional camp, and it got kids to either they go to a traditional experience for four weeks and then extend for two weeks or some, you know, just want to do the specialty, but it's attracted and held on to kids. So we have you know, culinary arts, kosher culinary arts in a number of camps. Oh we have uh, 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 courage courses um, that have been installed um, and uh, out in California, um, a whole host of um either ocean or mountain biking, um, you know, type camps. I forgot to mention Ruma well, of the Rockies. Let Cal- me interrupt for a minute. This is, this, is, this is wonderful. Is there any compendium that people could get a directory? Do you produce yes, them? Yes, on our website, you can yeah. go to find a camp. Okay. It's a prominent, uh, you go to jewishcamp.org and, uh, and or type in, even if you type in find a Jewish camp, it'll take you there. And you can look at, we've got specialty horseback riding programs. We've got, uh, you know, uh, just uh, as I mentioned in Colorado, you can uh, do outdoor adventures at Ramah or at a Schwader camp uh, or uh, Ramah, uh, uh, JCC Ranch camp, which has got so many horses. It's a real horseback specialty, a Jewish specialty camp in a sense. So we're very proud of the range. I often say not every camp is right for every kid. But there is a camp that's right for every kid. I, I see uh, mention of Zeke, uh, mentioned uh, even Her- Herzl Camp put in a whole new uh, uh, program at their lake and really upgraded the, the uh, water sports at that camp, inspired by this idea of uh, um, specialty uh, skill building experiences within your traditional camp. Uh, people are just writing extraordinary testimonials, um, and I hope uh, you can browse through that. Some of them are, are fairly long. Um, again, I'm curious, you have regional centers now for camps in your network. Can you say something about that? So um, we realized that, uh, first of all, I'll make the, uh, you know, the great ideas don't uh, come from our office in New York, but they come from uh, these amazing professionals in the field. 
And so we, uh, we decided we wanted to make sure we were closer to the whole camp community in, in a different regions. So we started in Chicago, then LA, now Atlanta are our three centers right now. And we've hired directors who are bringing not only the camp communities together, but the federations, local funders, uh, and they bring additional training to, to that group of camps um, and additional sharing where there's common problems or common uh, issues. Um, I'm, I'm thinking now, uh, I didn't mention, should have mentioned uh, security. Yes, I was going to, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, I could say to this group of friends, uh, it's certainly, that is what keeps me up, you know, really, and I, have we, you can't protect, you know, these camps are on big, big properties. You can't fence, you can come in on public lakes. But what we, uh, we, we're developing a community that is working with each other, with local authorities. So that's why organizing by region helps even to, uh, to uh, better address um, yeah, security issues. We're working with the Secure Community Network of the Jewish Federations of North America. Um, they in turn have great relationships with Department of Homeland Security and, and then the regional and local authorities. So we're making some headway. But um, I will tell you that, um, you know, we, we all share the concern of growing anti-Semitism and uh, attack on, you know, on a college campus, on a local synagogue or campus. It, it's, uh, you know, it's not pleasant to think about. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, any work in the interfaith realm? I don't know the world of, of camps intimately. I assume there are Catholic camps and Mormon camps and maybe Buddhist camps. Have you had any interplay with those worlds? Uh, yes, we work very closely with the American Camp Association. That uh, That's the network with whom, where I've um, met some of these other faith-based uh, mm -hmm. organizations. Um, and we've worked together on some federal, uh, you know, at least bringing issues to light on a federal basis. Um, uh, which, you know, has, has been good. Um, they, you know, in many ways, they have different models from uh, the Jewish camps. A lot of them have been wanting to learn from us. Uh -huh. um, so there's been uh, sharing that way. Um, but again, some of the, uh, the American Camp Association is also works on a regional basis. Mm. So a number of camps get together either uh. within the county or within the state and so they're doing, um, you know, good uh, trainings uh, as well. Okay, we have a little bit of time. This gets a little bit dicey, but maybe if folks want to say a word or two in their own words, rather than me kind of uh, filtering it, we could try that. You would have to unmute yourself. I think we could do that, Jerry. If anybody wants to speak, why don't you raise your hand? Um, and that would be a reaction. And I can call on you and you could say something in your own words about your camp experience. Somebody wrote about her mother in Camp Louise in the 30s, if she's still on the call. I think Jeremy would enjoy that. Others have grandchildren in the camps. Uh, somebody, I think, uh, was in Georgia or had... Uh, Camp experience yeah, in Georgia. Georgia. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, you can, you can, uh, yeah, Rabbi Jan, Jan Kaufman, go ahead. Jan, can you hear me? Uh, this always gets dicey with technology. I'm going to unmute you, Jan. Yeah, I always get a little trepidant when you get into technology and unmuting and you can kind of waste a lot of time that way. Uh, okay, I'm unmuted? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So, hi, it's Jan Kaufman. So, I was the one, my mother went to Camp Louise, went for eight years, she loved it. I'm also the one who asked the nerd question. I would not go to camp as a kid. Wait, because we can't see, you. We can't see your head. We see, all right. Okay. All right. Oh, better. I can see my head. So, I yeah. wouldn't go to camp as a kid. Because kids in Baltimore went to Louise or Airy and they were trafe, and I wouldn't want to spend the summer in the trafe camp. Right. And my mother said, you could sit at the kosher table, and I didn't want to be the nerdy kid at the kosher table. But also, I didn't like hot 
weather. I don't like bugs. <laughs> you know, I don't want to share space. I'm an only child. But I would have gone to camp to study more Hebrew. I would have gone to camp to um, to do more cooking. I would have gone to camp for those reasons. And I, I didn't want to be made fun of because I'm not a jock. And kids who go to camp who are not jocks really seem to oh. not have a good time. But listen, I, I'll tell you the camp. I would, uh, Janet's here. I, I I would send you to one of the uh, uh, to uh, the Susie Fishbein Culinary Camp at uh, Camp Nashville, the New Jersey Y uh, camps. Uh, and I, I went to see they converted an old uh, a building into a high tech learning kitchen. Uh, you know, high end learning kitchen with mirrors and. And good acoustics, and there were, I think, space for 24 uh, people to to be cooking and prepping, and they were learning the skills of knives and recipes, and uh, just amazing. And now other camps have really done that, been very successful at. It. So you should only know when I, but when I die, my money. I don't know if Jill's on the phone or not, but my money's going to Ramah. So. <laughs> All right. I, I should say that I've gone to Camp Ramah, was a counselor in training, and Masad. I don't think Masad exists anymore, does it, Jeremy? No, Mindy, I, I tell the story that uh, Camp Masad, people that went there, had a connection there, passionate about that experience. And the best way I can describe our foundation is when Camp Masad was having trouble in the 80s, if we had been around, that camp would still be around. We would have put the resources together uh -huh. and, and done whatever it took, find, find the right combination of support to make sure that that camp was still vibrant, active and, and uh, growing. Yeah, that was a formative experience for many of us. Anyone else want to say uh, a few words? Uh, we, we have a, a little bit of time still left. Let, let me ask you a question, that Jeremy. I'll take Go ahead, Jerry. Advantage of being the host. <laughs> um, I learned uh, a few years ago, that there are now camps for older individuals, hmm. not for, for 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 kids, but for like retired people. I don't know if you've been involved with that at all. Well, I I, I made the statement, uh, and I'll reinforce. We believe Jewish camp needs to be year round and lifelong, and <laughs> so lifelong uh, in, it means uh, uh, very creative ways. There are camps, a uh, grandparent and grand children camps, uh, you know, uh, weekends or, you know, extended week long for the two generate, you know, the grandparent and grandchild. Um, there has been a whole adult retreating uh, industry mm. um, that has, you know, it was very popular, I think, in, uh, in, in the Catskills and, uh, you know, around New York. Um, those in general have really gone out of business. Um, it just, the population it just didn't keep up. And fortunately, the work of our foundation and working with the, uh, in, in local basis, we've been able to convert some of those properties that were owned by UJA Federation of New York uh, into some of these specialty camps. So uh, Camp Zeke is on uh, what was the old Lock and Hexter uh, Adult uh, Retreat Center, um, Berkshire Hills, Eisenberg camp in upstate New York had a children's camp and then an adult camp uh, that's gone out of business, but we've converting and now using that property uh, for some of the specialty uh, tracks that's uh, been very uh, successful as well. Okay, uh, Lori Kelson. Lori? Yeah. Unmute yourself, Lori. Sorry, I did, thank you. From Southern California. Uh, Rabbi Alfred Wolf of uh, Wilshire Boulevard Temple of Blessed Memory, he was so about camping from having done camping in Germany, then he came to America to study to be a rabbi and was saved from the Holocaust. And he felt the perfect triangle was home, temple, Jewish sleepaway camp. And he says, one of the three, hopefully all, will get your kids. And definitely my daughters just loved it. They cried when they came home from camp. And uh, just, uh, Lori, you'll, uh, uh, we're working very closely with uh, the House Kramer and, and the w Wilshire Boulevard Temple on the rebuild. That camp was absolutely destroyed in, in the wildfires in California um, four yes. years ago. Yes. And um, 
I've been out to the property. I was out to the property before, but then I went uh, to see the devastation. It's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. Um, but uh, there, uh, there were four camps in North, in California that uh, right. had, had uh, burned down, and we're working on uh, the plans for rebuilding, the fundraising for rebuilding. Um, it's, yeah, it's they're really working. Great. You know, they've been they've been meeting on uh, you know temporary properties, uh, renting right. it in cam uh, college campuses, and and these professionals they've done an amazing job of you know holding things together at a time when they had lost lost everything you know absolutely. Uh, yeah ab absolutely what i put in the chat is what my daughter wrote after who is now 45 what she wrote after oh. camp burned down oh. and it just it's just such a special place granted it's also in southern california and malibu by the ocean but uh yes it's a, just a, a remarkable place thank you Thank you. Um, what about camps in other parts of the world, Jeremy, Jewish camps? Do you have any, any word on that? So um, I'm glad you, uh, you, you mentioned it. There are camping is a Jewish camp is a global behavior. And um, it's been a, uh, a successful in the former Soviet Union in Eastern uh, Europe. Uh, uh, you know, both uh, there's a camp Saravash, which uh, uh, runs in outside of Budapest in Hungary. Um, it's a very successful uh, track record. Hmm. The Jewish Agency for Israel runs camps in the FSU. Um, and uh, the Union for Progressive Judaism has, I think, 13, maybe 10 to 13 camps um, as part of, you know, around the world. And What's really interesting and we're excited about is Israel. There's an initiative now in Israel to uh, a, a forum for summer camps in Israel to help either start or to help grow current uh, uh, summer experiences for uh, young people in Israel during the, they call it the Chofesh, I think Chofesh Gadol, but in August when they're out of school and there's nothing, it's to get kids to get off their screens, to go for uh, two weeks and uh, or, or, or 10 days or so. And um, and the feedback has just been incredible. What, so what, about, yeah. Yeah, so what about Latin American? Yeah, what about Latin America? There's a significant population in Argentina, uh, Mexico, and Brazil. Any, anything there? So I know Argentina, I think in, in Argentina, Brazil. I don't know about Mexico. Um, but I know that we're getting staff members from Mexico and Panama and, uh, um, you know, and from South America, um, Jew Jewish uh, counselors and staff uh, are coming. Um, yeah. But it's something we're working, uh, looking at and exploring. I do think camps are global behavior and um, we can learn. I'm really interested, personally, I'm interested in global peoplehood and uh, the fact that uh, here's a great opportunity in camp to learn and to experience that Jews all over the world, and but we share so much in common. I guess there were camps in Russia. There yeah. were. I, I leave it there. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more question or comment. Uh, if anybody would like to share their thoughts, I know we, we all benefit from that and uh, expand our knowledge. If not, then... I don't I'm see. just going to share my screen so uh, you can see. Uh, please uh, feel mm. free to reach out. Uh, I put my number and my email. If you have any questions, happy to uh, uh, happy to share. Oh, this picture is uh, from Capitol Camps and Retreat Center. So at least we got some Washington D.C. Uh, you know experience. Uh, you know for you. Oh, here's a de here's a demographic question. Any sense of a breakdown between girls and boys going to Jewish camps? It's a little bit higher, um, uh, girls to boys. I think it's, but probably like 54, 46, you know, uh, a little a little more girl. But but overall, and and I think you know some of the work in the specialty camps has been able to uh, uh, um, track the number of. Uh, you know, uh, trying to keep more um, teens in, in, in the, involved and engaged. 
Penny, thank you for your, your kind words. This was wonderful, Jeremy. And I know that the foundation would not be unhappy if people didn't make donations to its work. So you certainly can reach out to the, the staff and to Jeremy personally. And um, I've enjoyed this enormously. And um, may the coming summer be a fine one. And may the summers to come be even better. Amen. Amen. Um, let me let me take over a little bit now. Um, first of all, let me make a comment about camps. A few years ago, when I was waiting for my daughter to come back, you know, a, a bus was bringing back the, the kids from, from camp. I was talking to some other parents, and uh, one parent said that she's so in love. She she thinks camps, Jewish camps in particular, are so good that when she was hiring people for her own business. She would, she would very much uh, favor people who had camp counselor experience because she thought camp counselors learn so much. So it can help you in your future career. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I thank you, uh, Jeremy. It was a very uh, wonderful and enlightening uh, presentation. And thank you, Mindy, for both introducing it for the good questioning that you did. Um, a week from today is actually the second Zeta, so we're not going to have a class. Uh, we're not going to have any classes during, during Passover, of course. Um, you're welcome to come to my Zeta if you want. Um, <laughs> Minnie will be coming. <laughs> anyway, um, we will be having classes again starting in, um, well, actually, we'll have classes in April after Passover. Uh, we're going to have um, at least one class at the end of April, a, a joint class with the, uh, well, we have, actually we have two classes in, in April on, on, Jew, on Jewish genealogy. And then we'll have a class, another session a little later that I will myself be presenting uh, uh, on, on my history, uh, the Jewish gene genealogical history that I learned about. And we have other, other interesting classes, including something with, with Michael Strasfeld, who was the co-writer of Jewish Catalog One, Catalog Two, and Catalog Three. Um, and then we have other classes that we're in development. So uh, stay tuned and you'll get emails about our, our new classes. And uh, 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 good job, everyone. And I hug, hug some ask, a Pesach. Hug Pesach some ask, all right. Shalom, shalom. And thanks for all the people who joined us from uh, different parts of the country. And when I write, when I give you an email with the uh, information on how to get to the recording, I'll also have some more information about the Federation for Jewish Camp. Hit road. Thank you so much. Bye bye, everyone.